here's the first screen. Everyone should see uh, a quote on the upper portion of that screen said, simplicity is the master key to investment success. Quote from John Bogle. And uh, we did title this talk Uncommon Common Sense, Investing in Index Funds, because I think of it as uncommon common sense. Maybe a little more common than it was 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, but still, it's the kind of common sense that a lot of people don't have. Uh, and I'd like to definitely uh, acknowledge the fact that this was adapted from an original presentation that was created by uh, Jerome, or Simon as he's called on the forum, and he's part of the Metro Boston Bogleheads. We'll go to the next screen. Okay, everybody see a piggy bank in the upper right? Chris? Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so this is an interesting, this is the US historical returns and from 1901 to about 1915 uh, to 2015. And uh, this is to demonstrate if you invested $1 in 1901 in US stocks, and didn't touch it for 115 years, at the end of that period, you'd have about $33,255. Everybody sees this right here at 9.5%. Now that's nominal. Below that is bonds. If you'd invested $1 in US bonds for that same period, you'd have about a 4.9% return or $237. Now there's a few caveats to that. This is before taxes and it does not account for inflation. So this is kind of a, uh, a rosy picture that maybe uh, you'll see this a lot in, in different investment articles, and this perhaps is not a, uh, a true picture. Okay, and, and that top bar there, the S&P 500 is what is used, and that of course is a simulated S&P 500 because the S&P uh, as 500 did not exist back in 1900 or 1901. Uh, most of you know it was an S&P 50 until about uh, 1957. Uh, in which case it changed. But the Standard & Poor's Company, of course, has been around for a long time. This is basically to demonstrate that stocks is the way to go. Bonds, I, I think I'll just mention here as a caveat that that 4.9%, uh, that's not very, you're not gonna get that same rate going forward. At least that's, that's what we think. Uh, definitely not for the next few years. If you'll notice that after 1980, that bonds suddenly took off and that's reason, because of the interest rates uh, were reduced over that period of time. So that's why bonds outperformed. Uh, so I would suggest that going forward for at least the next couple of years, it'll probably be a 0% uh, real or possibly one or 2% nominal. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what we're gonna try to do today, this is uh, fairly, uh, fairly rudimentary. The first two is what is an index? And what is an index fund? And then the next few items, active funds versus passive, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll look into one particular fund, investigate it uh, using Vanguard and Morningstar tools. And then I'll give a few portfolio examples based on index funds. And then we'll conclude and you can pepper me with questions. Okay. Okay. So let's start off with what is an index? What is a stock market index in particular? So Wikipedia says a stock index is a measurement of the value of, the, of a section of the stock market. Now, obviously if it's total stock market, it's a very, a very big section, but it doesn't have to be. And it's computed from the price of selected stocks, uh, basically a, weight, a weighted average of those values. So in other words, those indices or indexes, I think either way is fine, consist of an imaginary portfolio of securities. Uh, representing a particular market. Uh, when I say imaginary, I don't mean it doesn't exist. It's just a uh, uh, term of speech. There we are. So here's a couple of examples. The Standard & Poor's 500 or the S&P 500. Now that's United States, a stock market index based on the market capitalization of 500 large companies. Uh, not necessarily the largest, there are other criteria, but basically uh, in a, it's sort of a, by and large, it's one of the, the 500 larger, uh, almost the largest. I don't know how to say, I don't know what I'm saying there. Uh, not the largest because that's not the sole criteria. There are other criteria. Okay, there's also the Dow Jones Industrial Average. There used to be uh, many Dow Jones averages. Uh, 
the one that has survived and is best known is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And it's a stock market index that tracks approximately 30 large publicly owned companies. And they have even uh, a different set of criteria. Uh, and so they're definitely not gonna find the largest in there. And they actually sample out of the various uh, sub industries, I'll say. So they have a little bit of technology, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, so the market that is most faithful, I think, to the total stock market, if you're looking for an index that, that's gonna track this closest is probably the S&P 500 or a similar index. Okay, another one is the tech market, the NASDAQ composite, which is composed of common stocks uh, weighted very heavily toward the information technology companies. Now let's uh, go back in time a little bit and not very far back. Uh, this is seven years back, seven years in 2013. That's not very, that's not very far. It's several years after the big recession we had and a little bit into the recovery uh, from the 2008 recession. And at that time, the top 10 S&P 500 companies were Apple, ExxonMobil, Google, Microsoft, GE, Johnson & Johnson, Chevron, Procter & Gamble, JP Morgan, and Wells Fargo. So Apple, you think that is very much, but what about these other companies? Let's just see what happened in seven years. This is today, uh, of uh, the end of August. Uh, first, we have Apple. Index weighting has gone up. It's now 7.3. We have Microsoft is next, Amazon. Then you'll notice that number five and six, Alphabet. Those are, that's a uh, class A and class C shares of Google. And if you combine those, which you'll see on the next screen, uh, that actually puts them at number four and Facebook is number five as far as the largest components. Then we have Berkshire Hathaway and so forth. Now, I'd like you to note that it's just seven years, the seven, last seven years, that GE, Chevron, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and ExxonMobil are no longer in those top 10. In some cases, much further down, they're much smaller market share. Uh, they've been replaced uh, by other companies. So I'd like to ask you, if you just to think for a second, if you were investing in 2013, if you made some investing decisions there and you were selecting, particularly if you're selecting stocks, you could probably go back 15 years and ask the same questions. Would you know not to invest in General Electric, Chevron, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, or Exxon? Uh, they were pretty popular back then and they were also some of the largest uh, of the entire Standard & Poor's. Those were replaced by Visa, Tesla, Amazon, Facebook, and Berkshire Hathaway. Now, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, they've really talked that up, but I noticed when I went back and did the internet search for Berkshire Hathaway searches for people, in other words, Googling Berkshire Hathaway, most of that came in the last six years. If you go back 10 or 15 years, the awareness, even though we think we've, we, we know this company well, uh, for that matter, Tesla, if you go back 15 years, 10 or 15 years, people were not buying those stocks. Uh, obviously some people did because they've, they've gone up greatly in uh, value, uh, but uh, they weren't as popular as Exxon Mobil or JP Morgan. Those are considered the, the uh, heady, heady stocks. So this is one advantage of owning an index, or I should say a number of index funds that capture the entire index. Because what happened when GE went down and Visa and Tesla took off, we were able to benefit from that uh, depending on their market cap. So it kind of went up at the same time. This is a different way to look at it. This is Vanguard uh, total stock market index fund, Admiral shares. Uh, these are the top 10. Apple is nearly 6% currently. This is as of last month at the end of uh, September 30th. Apple and then Microsoft, Amazon, and there's Alphabet, which is Google. Uh, You'll see the, the top 10 there represent 25% of total net assets for the stock market. Uh, that's pretty impressive. So basically when, when Apple even faints that they might have a new product, when there's just gossip, uh, their stock goes up and you're, you, uh, those investments go up as well if you own total stock market. Uh, likewise, if uh, there's a rumor or report that Amazon is uh, gonna have some losses or Microsoft some of their products aren't doing very well. That'll go down a little bit. So that can affect the stock market as well. Uh, if you own all of those, 
all that is sort of ironed out over time. So I wanted to talk about uh, where do these uh, indexes come from? And the answer is uh, essentially they come from private companies. Uh, I think the New York Times is still an owner of some, the Wall Street Journal is owner of other indexes, but the Dow Jones that you see here on your upper left, the Russell, the S&P, the MSCI, CRISP, and the FTSE down here, these are all separate companies and they all support different indexes. Now this uh, particular screen was uh, provided, I think about five years ago, and they're actually, all of those have expanded. There is far more indexes than what are shown on the screen, but this will give you an idea. Uh, Vanguard has increasingly gone from Russell to CRISP indexes. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what an index fund is. Here's the definition that uh, we're presenting today. Uh, basically, it's a fund that pools investor capital. And the purpose of that, of course, is to invest in stocks or securities. Uh, I guess it could also be bonds as well. Uh, so what, what do we call those? We call them mutual funds. If you're pooling uh, for a, uh, a, a traded fund in the mutual fund, according to the Mutual Fund Act of 1940, it's a certain structure. There's also exchange traded funds or ETFs. I don't plan on emphasizing ETFs too much today because almost everything I'm gonna say about index funds will also apply to exchange traded funds or ETFs. ETFs are sort of independent of the brokerage structure and they can be uh, rather of the mutual fund um, uh, world and you can actually trade those separately. So they're, they're awfully low cost, which is what makes them so attractive. Uh, but basically whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund, an index fund attempts to replicate the movements of an index of a particular financial market or possibly the whole market. If it's total stock market, that's trying to get the whole thing. Uh, so those indexes, what happens with that? Here's a little bit of the, uh, the, the cycle. Investors put their money together, usually through a fund manager, say Vanguard or, or another uh, entity. They invest that in stocks or bonds and that generates returns, hopefully. And those returns are passed back to investors. And so this is an uh, index funds vary from uh, active funds in that the, in the, the funds are following a particular index that they've identified. Okay, let's move on. So a well-managed index fund gives investors, and this is sort of, a, a, we're gonna discuss this a little bit more later. It gives you a rather easy way to access various advantages uh, because in general, index funds are lower cost they provide increased tax efficiency, although not necessarily in the same level as stocks, but it, we're talking about the world of mutual funds, index funds uh, are much more efficient. Um, style consistency and reduced manager risk. And we can talk about that if you'd like. Reduced manager risk because the manager has basically one goal and that is to match the index, to mirror that index. He's not trying to beat the market. And here are just a, a few examples of index funds. There are multiple companies that provide index funds and you see five of them, I usually in Vanguard, Fidelity, all the big ones. Uh, there are obviously hundreds of companies, maybe thousands. Um, my understanding is there are more mutual funds and ETFs than there are uh, stocks on the public stock market. So that should tell you how many there are, probably four or 5,000 uh, different mutual funds. Not that many companies, but that many mutual funds. Okay, here, here's a few from Vanguard. Uh, there's total stock market. Some of those um, VTSMX, I'm not sure that's what they use now because that's probably investor shares. Uh, there's S&P 500, small caps, uh, US REITs, that's uh, real estate investment trusts. Then we have international, emerging, emerging markets is usually what it's called. And then we have a couple here that for bonds. One is the total US bond market. And uh, I should emphasize that that's sort of a misnomer. It's not the total US bond market. It's kind of a combination of corporates and treasury bonds. Then we have uh, TIPS, inflation adjusted bonds and endless number. I think they have about 250, maybe more. So uh, I'll let you read this. Studies have shown that monkeys can pick stocks better than most professionals. That's why the Dogbert mutual fund employs only monkeys. Uh, this goes back a few, I think this is probably goes back 15 or 20 years. Uh, I don't remember reading it at the time. So we're going to talk a little bit about active funds versus passive or index funds. 
And to do that, I'm hoping that this, uh, this is basically an audio from Rick Van Ness. It's, about a, it's a very short video. Uh, and I'm hoping that everyone can hear the audio. And if not, I'm gonna rely on Chris or, uh, or Dave Burns to let me know and we'll restart it. So. We can hear it. In prior videos, we established that you'll want both stocks and bonds from- Oops. Well, I'll try that again. Yeah, because they're not away. I was trying to get it full screen, but I, I don't know how to do that. In prior videos, we established that you'll want both stocks and bonds from many diversified companies and that you need to avoid market timing. Mutual funds are definitely the convenient way to invest in hundreds or even thousands of diverse companies. So how do you recognize a good mutual fund from a bad one? This is where our instincts get us in trouble. We are comfortable using rating systems to guide our other purchases. So many people are attracted to mutual funds rated four or five stars. Here's an actively managed fund that tries to beat the market return and a passively managed fund that attempts to match the market return. A key point that I want you to understand is that these rankings are based on past performance, so of very little relevance. Here's why. Remember, the market is the collection of all stocks, all investors. So for every active manager who beats the average market return, another loses by the same amount. Unfortunately, the only way to profit from those winning funds is to know the winners in advance, which is impossible to know. There are a variety of reasons why winners don't enjoy persistent success. Sometimes success attracts an overwhelming amount of new money to a fund. Sometimes the manager's style of investing goes out of favor. And sometimes the manager was never good, just lucky, and their luck runs out. In contrast, index funds are passively managed and can be very low cost. An index fund simply owns all the stocks that make up an asset category, or in this case, all asset categories. The goal is not to beat the market, but to match the overall market return as measured by a benchmark index. So for instance, the S&P 500 is a benchmark index for the 500 largest companies in the United States. A different, broader index benchmarks the entire stock market. Active funds require a talented staff, excellent, insightful research to try to predict which companies will outperform tomorrow, and frequent trading. All these expenses get paid first. Investors just get what is left. So to beat the market after subtracting these costs is very challenging. Only 37% of active funds beat the market every year. But there is very little persistence, and within five years, the number of winners has dropped to 25%. Over a period of 10 years, a mere 15% of the active funds beat the market return, which is what you would get if you invested in a low-cost, highly diversified index fund. Imagine if you want to invest $10,000, and there are only nine mutual funds in the world. Eight of them are active funds with an annual cost of 2%. One of them is a low-cost index fund, which closely tracks the overall market return. You are clairvoyant and can foresee that you have two out of eight chances of outperforming the market over the next five years, and you know the odds will decline further with time. The reward for such long odds is an extra two or $4,000, but the average return from all the active funds is less than the market return by $1,300, the same as the amount subtracted for expenses. You have this information, so you further notice that if it wasn't for those expenses, four of the active funds would beat the market, and four would not. And averaged together, the eight active funds would have achieved the market return. After all, that's what the market return is, by definition. You can know the odds, you can know the arithmetic, but you can't know in advance which funds are going to outperform, so we'll cover them up. You are going to have to guess. Do you want to invest in the index fund and get the average market return? Or do you want to try to beat the market with one of the active funds? And if so, which one? Congratulations if you chose the index fund. 
it shows that you are a rational, risk-averse investor. Now, do you agree with me that this ranking might be a little misleading? Five stars for a fund that outperformed recently, but has a very low chance of outperforming over the next 10 years? And of course the index fund is only rated mid-pack. It can't outperform the market. It tracks the market. The best predictive measures of a fund's future performance are its costs and how closely it tracks the market. Find other explanatory videos, smart tips, and links to useful resources at financinglife.org. Uh, I don't think I could, in fact, I know I could not have explained uh, the difference between active and passive as neatly and as succinctly uh, and smartly as uh, Rick did. So that's why uh, this video is on here. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, index funds in general. Index funds obviously are increasingly popular. I think when this, uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago, that would have been an interesting thing to say. At this point, it's almost a given. Now you see on this particular chart, the growth of an index fund from 1970, mid-1970s through, uh, through, through 2015. And you see that the assets had gone from, well, not much, 10 million to 4 trillion. I think it's well beyond that point. I'm not sure what the, the last time I paid attention, uh, the, uh, the percentage of funds, of the mutual fund market, the stock market, uh, which is devoted to index funds, in other words, invested in index funds, I think was 40 or 45 percent, but it may be higher than that at this point. This chart only shows 34 percent. But what I find interesting is the first 10, 12 years of Vanguard. Oh, let's go back here. I, I lost that screen. Hold on. There we are. Uh, the last uh, 10, the first 10 years or 15 years of Vanguard, oh, it was like less than one percent. So they had a, quite a bit of quite a slog. I think Vanguard started their first index fund in 76 or 77. And uh, I joined about 2003. So they already had 15% or 14% of the market. At this point, it's probably triple that. So index funds, obviously, a lot of people have caught on at this point. All right, here, here we are. Uh, Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett, two of the greatest active investors apparently agree with this. Now there's been, uh, this quote was taken just about seven or eight years old. Uh, Warren Buffett has had many other good things to say about index funds since this one. Uh, but this quote says, uh, a low cost index fund is the most sensible equity investment for the great majority of investors. His mentor, Ben Graham, uh, took this position many years ago. And he said, everything I've seen since convinces me of its truth. And you can find, uh, I think those close to a dime a dozen now. Uh, so let's talk about a particular fund, uh, and let's, let's use a couple of tools that are readily available at Morningstar and Vanguard. So as an example, we're going to pick, let's see if I can get this, there we are. We're going to be looking at, in, for Morningstar, the VTSMX, which is the total stock market index fund investor shares. Um, right now, I think they're, you can only look at, uh, I think only the Admiral is available for investment at this point but I could be wrong. Maybe they're still allowing, uh, before Admiral funds were basically, you had to have $10,000 and now I think they're, they're all $3,000. So what, this is basically the Morningstar screen or it was a couple of years ago uh, that demonstrates various aspects of a particular fund. This is one way you can look at or investigate a fund. And I'm gonna piece it apart here. There we go. Um, the author of the original presentation had a very low opinion of uh, the stars and the gold and the silver medals that are handed out by Morningstar uh, to this particular fund. Uh, so he said they're pretty much meaningless. Well, they have some meaning. Uh, what they mean is that the, uh, this particular fund has done rather well. We get four or five stars for the last five or 10 years, it's done rather well compared to uh, the uh, other, other funds. Uh, the gold, I've forgotten why they offer gold and silver. I think maybe turnover cost or stability. Okay, and this portion over here shows the net asset value, which in those days, about six years ago was, oh no, it was 2016, so four years ago, uh, was 52.95. Uh, one day total return, that means very little to me. I usually look at five and 10 year when I'm looking for my, uh, looking for myself. I haven't, I haven't added a mutual fund in a while, but uh, that's one thing I would look at was the 10-year. OK, 
Okay, here we go. Uh, so here's some important things. Just four years ago, the expenses for this uh, stock, total stock market index fund, the expenses were 0.16%. That's per annum, per year. And uh, what does that mean? Well, I call it 16 basis points or 16 thousandths. Um, so the expense ratio now for the admiral version, which I believe is the only one you can invest in, is four basis points. So one quarter. Uh, expense ratios are coming down everywhere across the industry. There's what they call the Vanguard effect. So you're going to find not only Vanguard funds that are much less costly uh, for their annual expenses, but uh, a lot of Fidelity funds and T. Rowe Price and Charles Schwab and you name it. Uh, all in the last 10 years, they've all, especially the last five, it's sort of accelerated. Uh, they even have Fidelity funds that are zero, but that's probably, those are probably lost leaders. Uh, so the other thing that Morningstar has here is they talk about fee level and they just say low, high, or, or normal. Uh, Vanguard's always had low fees. I think they're referring mostly to administrative fees at that point. Uh, there we go. Uh, so the minimum investment for most Vanguard funds are $3,000. But when you do your research on Morningstar, if you are going to buy a fund, that's something you want to pay attention to, particularly if you're starting with a small amount of money. Uh, this, this is something that I'm interested in is the turnover. 3% is very good for a broad market stock fund. Uh, it would be higher than that for a bond fund. Uh, but if you find uh, a mutual fund with 20 or 30 or 40% um, a turnover, you ought to be uh, wary of that fund because that generates a lot of internal costs. Um, and the, uh, the original author's opinion of those analyst reports is low. I, I've read a few of them. I, I, I would agree with him that there's not much point in paying the premium version of Morningstar to read those reports. I don't think you need to dig in that much. Uh, uh, what they offer is basically just an extension of everything they summarize here. Okay, so here, here's another Morningstar uh, slide uh, that gives you a sort of an idea. On the upper left is the growth of $10,000. That's kind of nice to see. The first thing I notice is there's an orange where it says large blend. That's their benchmark. And you notice that from 1991 or 1992, to the end of this period in 2016, that that orange is sort of starts off, the, they all start off the same and they end up, the orange is outperformed. And then above that, there's the S&P 500, which is the kind of the light green line. And then the blue line, which sort of overlaps it, especially when you get down to about 2003, uh, that is the VTSMX or the, the, the fund that we're researching. And you notice that at, at a certain point, you really can't tell the difference because the, they, they're just so close. I would say if they're very different, then there's a problem with the fund because it's not tracking it's uh, not tracking the index it should be. Okay, on the upper right, there's a risk measures and it shows that uh, the return category versus the category and the risk versus the category. Apparently average or plus average on both. Uh, there, it looks a little bit different nowadays, and I'm not sure I, how I relate with that. But anyway, um, I'm not going to talk about this because it, it's it's different. I think the when I last time I looked at Morningstar, they had a, a different setup. Uh, but this is, should be very familiar. This is the nine box Morningstar box. They're sort of known throughout the industry. This gives you an idea of the style of the fund. And by that I mean, is it a very large cap fund, a giant, uh, tiny, micro cap, uh, and value versus growth. Now there's a lot of uh, discussion and a lot of, oh, uh, maybe needless discussion about growth versus value. What is a growth stock? What is a value stock? That's a bit out of scope here. We could talk about that if you'd like. Uh, but needless, but for this purpose, for the stock that we're looking at right now, you can see that it's positioned right in the middle between value and growth. And they call that a blended stock or a blended mutual fund. And it is at the very top portion of the large, that large uh, section there, almost into giant, that tells you that the stocks in this particular fund tend to be very large. Below that is a uh, growth of 10,000, kind of in a table format. The fund has earned uh, year to date, when this was captured, 5.94% uh, for the last year, 5.19, uh, and then up to five, three year, five year, 10 year. Uh, like I said, when I'm looking at funds, if I'm considering buying, I'll look at the five, 10, 
and uh, since inception, those are the those are the figures I'm most interested in. Okay, and uh, this is a good point. The uh, recent performance, in other words, the last month, year, even three years, five years, uh, doesn't predict what's going to happen in the future. In fact, there tends to be a, sort of an irony in the industry, and if for mutual funds, unless they decide, unless they change their approach midway through, what often happens is the fund will do spectacularly well. Uh, better than a lot of other funds. And then that'll work for five, 10 years or forever long. And then the next five or 10 years, they may be the worst in the industry. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, okay, I think I already mentioned that point. Long-term performance relative to a benchmark is more interesting. Here the maximum is 10 years, 85,000. Okay, this is the... Style map gives you a the, talks about the market segment and their famous uh, nine star nine nine box uh, style box. Okay, so this is from Vanguard. This is using a Vanguard tool. Uh, basically, you can get to this just by googling uh, the name of the stock. You could type in Vanguard total stock market or something like that, and uh, click in the Vanguard link, and gives you. And this looks pretty much like it like it did a few years ago. You start here with the left, and this is the screen that provides an overview of this particular fund. The price performance, uh, it would be if I didn't skip past it. <laughs> All right, here we are. Uh, the price performance, portfolio management, um, fees, distribution, and then news. Uh, so the overview is obviously the first place we should start at, and it gives you a description of it. Uh, this particular fund, mentioned this before, 16 basis points is the expense ratio. You, uh, at that time, it was 84% lower than the average expense ratio. Uh, I know when I started with Vanguard, almost every fund that I chose said it was, oh, I don't know, 75, 80%, 90% lower than average. But because of the Vanguard effect and the industry has sort of suppressed those uh, expense ratios and brought them down, and Vanguard has as well, but basically it's kind of rare to find one that's 80% lower than the, the average. Uh, you can find expense ratios that, that are outrageously high, uh, one, two, three percent or more, uh, but that would be like 200 basis points or more. Uh, but mostly if you're looking at um, index funds, you're gonna find for the, the big carriers are not gonna charge you a whole lot. They're gonna be competitive with Vanguard or they're gonna try to be at least for most of their funds. Uh, the minimum investment here, I don't think that's changed is $3,000. This is for a regular account or a brokerage account, a regular mutual fund account. Uh, they also have 401k shops and that may be different. There may be a zero, um, you may be able to start off with $1. Uh, now, back in 2016 in October, four years ago, the price was 52.95. Uh, the change doesn't mean anything. I, mean, I usually, if I'm picking a fixed income fund or a bond fund of some type, money market, I'll look at the SEC yield. That That's a little bit more meaningful for me. Uh, then there's the risk potential, which is, Four in this case, if in any um, stock market is a risky place to be, uh, it's not risky forever. And of course, you have to remember that risk and reward are tied together. So uh, you have to have, take some risk if you're going to have any uh, benefit, meaning performance or return. Uh, here's an overview, a slightly different one, also from 2016. It shows the one, three, five. This is uh, basically the uh, CAGE, uh, C-A-G-R, the compound annual growth rate. Uh, since inception, it was around 9.6, 9.4. But let's say the, the 10 year from ba looking backwards from 2016, the same month is uh, 7.41. The benchmark, which is they used a, a kind of a combined benchmark was 7.53. So they slightly underperformed here. Uh, that's not uh, unexpected. Uh, they're, they're because there's costs involved. Then the growth of 10,000 chart shows that it kind of dipped down in 2008, became a fraction of what it was, like 45 or 50 percent down, and then on up to like 20,000. On the next page, you'll see a more up-to-date one, and that will be amazing. Uh, and remember that the performance is net of fees uh, that they show on Vanguard. Now, I'm not sure that every company will show it, that it'll show it this way. Uh, it's been a while since I bought a, a fund from a different company. But you want to make sure that you're looking at you're doing an apples to apples comparison when you're looking to include a uh, <coughs> excuse me 
when you're looking to buy an index fund. Um, this is what Morningstar and others do not emphasize enough. Basically, it's just the standard, <coughs> the standard uh, uh, caveat, the performance data shown represents past performance, doesn't guarantee future results. We, this is at basically up to date. This is as of 10-9, which is just yesterday. If I can leave it, keep it on the screen here. Um, and you notice that the 10 year, remember the previous one was about half that. So basically the last 10 years looking from 2020 backwards, our total stock market has been fantastic. 13.48 uh, um, compound annual growth. That's fantastic. Uh, the 2016 wasn't as good the last 10 years. And maybe some of you already know why, uh, because during from roughly 2000, 2001 to 2010, there was very little growth. It was not a good 10 year period for stocks, US stocks. Uh, so once you got past that, then, then those numbers started going up. So I think we've, uh, I think we've belabored this enough. If anyone has questions on this uh, during the Q and A later, we can come back to it. Just ask me to go back to the uh, Vanguard screens. So we're gonna talk about a couple of portfolio examples and then we'll end this thing. Um, now here are some popular portfolios. Uh, most of these have been popular for some time. And when I say popular, well, uh, they're in our wiki. Uh, they're in the Bogleheads wiki. And here is uh, at the, there's an address, a URL at the bottom of your screen, talks about lazy portfolios. Um, so these, these are kind of a good fit for many people who are starting off or if, you could, if you've been investing for a while and you can manage to get close to these, that's also a good fit. The three fund portfolio is usually attributed to Taylor Larimore, who was one of the co-founders of Bogleheads. Um, he may not have been the first person to think about this, uh, but he's definitely the first to propose it on the Bogleheads forum or the old uh, Vanguard Diehards forum. Um, now he is not a specific about what percentages are in each of those pie sections. Uh, others are, but this basically represents a 60-40 uh, portfolio. That means 60% stocks, 40% fixed income or bonds. So in this particular three fund split, we had the 40% bond portion that could include CDs, cash, or whatever, um, investable assets, 40% total market, such as the Vanguard Total Stock Market Fund or something similar at Schwab, Fidelity, um, and then 20% international. That means international equities or stocks. Notice that it does not include, and it probably would now, a, um, a allocation or a, uh, investment on, on to total international bonds. Um, most of Vanguard's all-in-one funds, fund of funds, include that uh, now automatically. And probably they, they did this starting a few years ago. Uh, probably a good thing too, because you notice that the bond portion is earning so little nowadays for the United States. Uh, and I have to say right around the world, it's not doing a whole lot better, but it may in the future. So the more diversification, the better. Uh, here's another portfolio example. A little more complicated than the three fund or four fund. This is from Bill Schultheis. Uh, he wrote a book called The Coffee House Portfolio. And yes, there are there are numerous coffee house uh, portfolios actually, so that's plural. Uh, but this is a, a pretty typical breakout for a 60-40. Here's the 40%. He suggests uh, investing in intermediate term bond. You have your large blend, that would be S&P 500. Uh, large value, so it's a value tilted portfolio. Then small blend, small value. Notice there's 10% each of these. Um, oops, there we are. Uh, and then 10% international and 10% REITs. So what can you say about this portfolio? Uh, it's a reasonable portfolio, but it's tilt. It's a tilted portfolio uh, toward value, toward small in value. Uh, only 10% international, that would be considered low, I think uh, for Vanguard at this point but a pretty significant tilt to REITs, which are real estate investment trusts. They sort of considered a separate uh, asset category because they have unique uh, attributes. They, they pay a little different. They act like stocks sometimes, but they have bond qualities. Uh, they're sort of a unique. Um, I should also mention that the, the REITs were more popular 10 or 15 years ago than they are now. Um, for what you, for, you make of that what you will. So sometimes things, there's the flavor of the month issue with uh, stocks and bonds. And I think that even in portfolio management, I think that probably encompasses Bogleheads as well as uh, any other investor approach. 
Uh, here's one from Rick Berry using a 60-40. Uh, much simpler. You notice he still has 6% REITs. Now that is, uh, that is a tilter REITs. In other words, there's a little bit more REITs than the, the typical portfolio because in the total stock market, as well as in the total international stock market, uh, you'll also find REITs in, the, in, the, um, in those uh, portfolios. So you're actually increasing the amount of REITs by 6%. So you have to decide whether that is a bet that you want to take. Uh, but apparently in this particular core four portfolio, Rick likes it. Maybe we'll get him on sometime to talk about that. Uh, I like the, the name of this portfolio. This is from Bill Bernstein called the Coward Portfolio. And this, this is a little dated. It goes back about 10 years, maybe more. Um, Bill has a lot of short-term bonds. He doesn't think much of uh, uh, mid, mid-term and long-term bonds. Uh, he has a, a nice fat portion, 15% to total stock market or an S&P. And then he basically is a slicer and dicer. He has large value, adds a little bit of small blend, small value, quite a tilt there. And then he has a, um, basically he uses political divisions uh, and creates a Europe, a Pacific, uh, certain, certain, in other words, he doesn't just do a, a, a large uh, international fund, but he... Uh, he cuts it up into various uh, sectors. Uh, sometimes uh, that would be a good idea. Uh, I don't know. The last 10 years have not been very good for those particular sectors. So I think if you'd, if you'd been a coward, you wouldn't have lost your shirt, but uh, you probably could have done better. Uh, he also has a small tilt to emerging markets and to REITs. Uh, I, I'm not trying to promote, and I don't think Bogoitz tries to promote any particular portfolio. Uh, although we talk all about the three fund portfolio quite a bit, uh, because depending on who you are, what your investment goals are, what your time horizon is, uh, one or more of these portfolios might make sense to you. Uh, so basically, this will, this will focus in on the three fund portfolio performance, and I'm going to tie this up here in another minute or so. Uh, if you invested $5,000 every year for the past 30 years, from 1985 to 2015, uh, you would have had $657,000 invested, that's hence the smiley face. If you had been passive funds, and that assumes a 0.2 or 20 basis point uh, uh, cost. Now, what's the difference between passive and active? Well, uh, although sometimes the, the active funds have come down a little bit, especially at Vanguard, uh, your active funds are about 10 times that. And if you had paid 10 times the fee structure or you had an assets under management fee of say one or 2%, uh, then you'd be making considerably less over a 30 year period. Uh, and now these are rather important. I'm gonna step through these and I think we'll be done. Um, so what are the advantages of indexing? Uh, obviously cost is the most important one. I don't think uh, there's any question about that. Well, if there was a successful actively managed index, uh, actively managed fund, um, that didn't follow an index but outperformed it, I think that would be unusual, especially uh, over 10 years or so, or 15 years. Uh, but uh, you should probably be wary of any, any fund that's done well in the last 10 years that's actively managed. Uh, I, I still have a few actively managed funds. They're all pretty conservative, low cost, low turnover. So that keeps the cost low. And you also should be aware of, of an actively managed fund that pretends to be one thing when it's, an, when it's trying to do something else. Uh, sometimes the uh, fund managers will decide after they've had the fund successful for a few years that they're going to tilt to something else that they like, or they're going to try to use a momentum approach or a profitability approach. And so they're going to apply different things. And now that may mean continued success for the fund, or it could mean that it's going to go in the, in, the, in the barrel and you just don't know which. Uh, another advantage of indexing funds, particularly if you uh, look at the broad market funds, the total stock market, and so forth, um, is the diversification benefit. Uh, that basically means you're lowering your risk. Uh, he quotes a study here, uh, talks about standard deviation from actively managed versus uh, a total stock market fund in five and 10 year periods, which I think is pretty brief. Uh, basically he says the actively managed funds were uh, on average more volatile. And I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's been uh, other studies have been done and I think they've found that to be correct. Uh, there's consistency. Uh, the total stock market fund is say 
among the top 25% of, of, the, of the, that fund type, the large blend of that style in only two of the last 10 years. And that should say something, that should be a, a flag. What does that mean? If it was, only, if it was ranked in the tw top 25% in only two of the 10 years, um, well, it's because it has to track the market. It has to, the, it has to track their own, their own index. And so other large blend funds have not been doing that. But what happens after that 10 years and after, the, and after another 10 years in, in the long run? Um, because of its consistency, falling below average, it outpaced 91% of all large blend stocks after taxes. I do not have a table on that. And I did try to find the reference, but I couldn't. Uh, but I'm sure we could uh, locate it with a little more, uh, little more skilled researching. Uh, then there's continuation, and this is used to be a very important thing because, and I guess it still is with other companies. If you uh, purchase a fund and it does rather well, but uh, then it goes into a bad period, it could get um, combined with a different fund, or you could get your money back because the uh, company doesn't want to uh, keep it open anymore, and so you you might you might lose some money that way. Of uh, 355 actively managed equity funds around in 74 in 2016, less than half still survive. Uh, most indexing funds, if you're with a reputable company, you don't have to worry about that. The company will still be there and the fund will still be there. Uh, and finally, style drift, uh, asset allocation determines about 90% plus or minus 4% of the variation in portfolio performance. Uh, the managed fund allocations can and often do change their style. So that's an advantage of the index funds. So finally, if you're just read one book on passive indexing, on passive investing, read Jack Bogle's book, Common Sense on Mutual Funds. Uh, in addition to that, if you've already read uh, Jack's book, uh, which is quite a tome, I recommend it. Uh, and you need more reading material or you would like that's a little simpler or on different subjects, uh, the members of Sacramento Area Bogleheads, we have compiled a hundred different books, podcasts, uh, and all sorts of resources. And I include the, 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 uh, uh, the URL link right here on the page. You don't have to copy it down. I'll send it out with uh, in, a, in a week or so uh, for this meeting. And we call it the Sacramento Area Bogleheads, 100 books, blogs, podcasts, and videos. So I hope that uh, nobody has one more thing to add because then we'll have to change it to 101. Okay, let's see here. Okay, we're done. So I'm ready to take questions. <laughs>